Hey, 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 it is morning once again at 6.06 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7.27.2018, I guess. I'm going right back to the table of New Testament quotes from the Old Testament to see if we can understand the context of these. I have read forward. I do try to do that as much as I have time to do that. There's some things I kind of noticed when I was reading forward. I've, I've noticed this before, but definitely want to point this out. <clears throat> the blending of secular history with history or a timeline as we understand it from the Bible. I think those two things may be very separate, independent things. The problem is, like some of the people I mentioned yesterday who are uh, content creators, very bright people, get a lot of very interesting stuff from them too, and helpful stuff, is that it seems like um, almost without variance, they tend to take the accepted timeline of history and events, rise and fall, rises and falls of kingdoms for granted. And so thus they design all of their presentations based on these things. I, however, don't know that we can take those things for granted. I do also know that there are enough differences in opinion concerning eschatology or the study of last things that I think everybody should keep a pretty open mind to us not understanding things very well. And possibly one of the biggest problems with our our lack of understanding currently is this very successful blend of uh, secular history and timelines with what we know of biblical history and timelines. <clears throat> I know that a good deal of people that listen specifically for those Fomenko readings, they actually, uh, well, they don't believe the biblical timeline is correct either. Maybe many of them actually don't believe the Bible is is factual or, is, or historical and uh, given. Um, that makes it understandable why a number of them are in such disagreement with me concerning uh, my... lack of respect for what both Fomenko and Marazov do with biblical texts. Their eisegetic interpretations of words and meanings and texts. And as I've said before, I wouldn't even have to be a believer in the, the factual history of the Bible to point out that both Fomenko and Marazov have mishandled the texts. You don't actually, it was the same thing with Commons Beaumont, you don't actually have to believe them in order to handle them correctly. I don't have to believe any document I'm reading to represent it accurately, factually, honestly. Okay? You don't have to have the one thing to have the other. 
So this is part of the point of, of what I'm doing here is because I do actually believe that there there are enough potential factors to formulate enough educated theories about why it is we're not quite seeing come to pass in a way that makes a whole lot of sense to us a lot of the eschatological portions of the Bible now that includes Old Testament it goes back very far in the Old Testament by the way just because it's Old Testament does not mean that it is not speaking eschatologically we see various sayings in Obri that concern last days and last days is somewhat arguable there can be the last days of a kingdom uh, there can be the last days of a system there can be the last days of a people there can be the last days of the world as we know it so there can be a lot of last days and there are various phrases used for last days and uh, as what seems to be commonplace with um, everything that seems to be echoing the style of translation used uh, by the King James translators I find it amazing that you know even Bibles that a lot of uh, KJV only people criticize these Bibles it's very interesting to me that they still follow um, textually and philosophically uh, King James, Geneva, um, Tyndale, about everybody who you could name who had something to do with an English Bible, even for a long time before the, the King James 1611 was supposedly written. Now, a lot of people could say, well, that's because they all had uh, essentially the same understanding of the languages and that, that may be so uh, however what a lot of uh, Bible versions today don't tell you is many 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 of them actually just base their translation on another current English translation and then make certain edits as they see fit um, that's what the King James translators did. They based uh, a great deal of what they did off of some current translations. And it was overseen by King James, and King James very much liked the power that he had being the head of the Anglican Church. He liked being king far more than he cared for Presbyterianism. So don't for a second start to think that there were no ulterior motives applied and that's not even to get into the possible Baconian Rosicrucian involvement and final edit of that work so yeah I suppose it's possible that a lot of these versions have such a similarity to them because they all understood the language in a certain way at least those who were making translations as far as pure translations from one language to another maybe
However, I would like you to keep in mind something that I brought up yesterday, which is a claim that does deserve to be proven. And if I had the time <laughs> and the resources, this would be something that I would do. And that claim was that there are so many items of similarity between the understanding that is illustrated in the what we have of current Masoretic texts as well as the Septuagint and even the Dead Sea Scrolls that I think it is a fair theory to say that they all may share similar roots in the sense that anybody who understands the Masoretic text understands that it is a text that has been altered. The literal shape of the character has been altered. The introduction of Nakud and Cantillation are alterations. And the understanding of words is an alteration. And the, the simple fact that 20% plus of words with unknown or dubious lexicography. We should see that as an alteration from the originals since anyone alive at the time of the originals would have understood the originals. And I, I would say that those originals would be kept in trust by the priests perpetually to some point. So when somebody theorizes that we have all the checks and balances we need between the current texts that we have, I can't say that I believe that to be true because no other extant text fills in the gap problems in the lack of understanding that is shown in so many obri words that are misrepresented in the Masoretic text. There isn't a complete understanding of the source language of Obri. And I believe that the Septuagint and all I have seen and heard from the Dead Sea Scrolls just echoes that. So, the next quote that we would find from the so-called Old Testament is Matthew 2.6. It reads in the AV, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now that is to be taken from Micah 5.2 in both the A.V. and Brenton Septuagint. So the context in Matthew is that this is when the Magi, <clears throat> the Magi from the East, they are interesting. And there's been a lot of speculation on who they are. Um, Many in CI speculate that they were Parthians. This whole idea of Parthia is really interesting since let's just say the historical understanding of this place is pretty weird, but I won't go into that. Anyways, nobody has any definite proof of who these Magi were and where they were necessarily from, but they had definitely come 
looking for the king. And, of course, this time, the king was not a Judahite nor an Israelite of any kind. He was an Edomite by the family name Herod. And when they came looking for the king, of course, this was a great threat to Herod, he called the scribes and the chief priests, and he wanted to know what this was all about. And in Matthew 2, 5, <clears throat> they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. He wanted to know where the child should be born. Thus is written by the prophet, Matthew 2, 6, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people, Yisrael. Hmm. Hegiomai is the Greek on that. 2233, and we're not going to dig into the Greek too much. I don't see it as a helping us a lot. Anyways, a chief court esteemed governor judge. So the uh, the reference for that then is back in Micah five two. What's interesting, real quick, is when Micah lived and prophesied and wrote this book. So he was a contemporary then with Yeshua. Um, his name would more properly be pronounced Mikah, or, I know, just hold on, possibly Mike. Why? Well, because as I study Obri more and more and more and more, it strikes me as phenomenally strange how similar to English it is. And I've found so many words that end with the E, and E can mean a number of things. Oftentimes the E at the end can be uh, feminine. It isn't always, but it can be. Um, I have found these words with uh, the basic English form where we have a starter consonant, a middle consonant, the middle consonant preceded and succeeded by a vowel. The successive vowel being an E, so the preceding vowel possibly being uh, pronounced with a strong vowel sound. So maybe his name was Mike. If not, we'll stay with Mike. How about Mika? Mika could be Mika Mike. So, anyways, the context of it, it definitely has an eschatological con context to it. Uh, unlike the uh, quote that we saw yesterday in uh, in um, Yeshua seven fourteen. That particular quote did not so much have an eschatological context to it. It had a very contemporary context to it. But this does not. To get the context of it, you would have to start at least at Micah 4.1. And it says, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of Yahweh shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. This kind of language is continued. There is a whole lot concerning the reestablishing of the rem remnant and the cast off of Yisrael. This has much to do with, uh, it would seem, it has much to do with geographical redemption, as well as the redemption that was promised to Yisrael in um, Hosea 
or Yusha, one. When they were called uh, La Omi, not my people, but they were promised to have been multiplied greatly and redeemed. And it says, now in the place that you were called La Omi, not my people, you will be called sons of the living God. Now what's very interesting about that, keep this in mind, that the reason that virtually every translation you read of that will say, but in the place, is because the word being used means the physical location. So where they were when Hosea, or Yisho, it's almost the same as Joshua's name, Hosea. It's just one character difference. So you have either a Yusho or just pretty much you'll drop the uh, you'll drop the Y at the beginning and just get Yusho, Yusho or Yusho. So, anyways, um, I think that's important because when Yusho or Hosea was prophesying against Israel, they were in the land, dwelling where they had dwelled for centuries, in the place where it was said to you, not my people, you shall be called sons of the living God. And that certainly has not happened in Palestine. So when we get to uh, Mike <laughs> five one, um, so we can read the uh, the few preceding verses. Gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Yisrael with a rod upon the cheek. But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, <clears throat> the Septuagint, just bounce over to Brenton real quick, it's nearly the same thing, and the context is pretty much the same too, with just a little bit. The, the biggest difference between Brenton Septuagint and KJV, besides a little bit of language tweaks, is most of the proper nouns and names and stuff. You can tell they've been translated into English from a Greek bent. But even that should be an illustration. The Greek bent to the pronunciation of these proper nouns should even there show you that it is highly likely that what we understand today as the Septuagint was taken from a text or texts of a Masoretic understanding with their Nikud and pronunciation and lack of understanding of at least 20% of the words. That's 1,600 plus words contained in the so-called Old Testament. And that's just the 39 books that are part of the current accepted canon. So, a prath first appears in Genesis 35. It is after Jacob, Jacob had gone to Bethal because his mother, well, her nurse died and they buried her and he was journeying back from Bethal. And on the way, it says in Genesis thirty-five sixteen. They journeyed from Beth Al, and there was but a little way to come to Aprath. And Rahal travailed, and she had hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass, as her soul was departing, for she died, 
that she called his name Ben and it's A U N Y Auni Ben Auni but his father called him Ben Yimin which would <clears throat> they say would essentially be the son of my right hand um depending on which way you want to interpret that string of roots you mean being interpreted as the right hand um bene my son and mean can be from so, all right, anyways, that's Aprath. Now, in Micah 5 2, it the word, <coughs> excuse me, is Aprathe. It's my contention that the E at the end of a place like Aprath means the area, the area of. You'll see this all the time. Doesn't have to be a so-called tav or th. I see it frequently. And you can look at it in context and can tell that what is being said is the area of, and you'll see that e at the end of locations. So, aprath a, uh, the area of. Now, I'm going to make a quick illustration with aprath. So, according to Masoretic tradition, their translation would be pronounced F. Roth. F. Roth. Keep that in mind. I'm going to bring up Brenton's Septuagint. And in Micah 5 2, it says, And thou, Bethlehem, house of Ephrathah. You just put that E at the end. Ephratha. And remember, King James was said to have pulled from the Masoretic, Brenton's from the Septuagint. Ephratha in Brenton's Septuagint. Here is the pronunciation of it according to Blue Letter Bible's version of Strong's Hebrew Concordance. So I just find that interesting that Brenton, pulling from the Greek Septuagint, has got that same fiat Masoretic pronunciation. And this isn't an odd thing. It's par for the course. So after this, Micah goes on and a lot of the language is real eschatological last day stuff. Real interesting too. And the reason it's so interesting is because it does parallel a lot of the other eschatological passages we'll find between virtually all of the prophets in the so-called Old Testament. What's so interesting about it is based on what history we know and understand, and that would be biblical history or and or secular history put together, we haven't seen these kinds of things occur, and not in these kinds of ways. There, there is a large school of thought that basically ignores most of Old Testament prophecy with the assumption that it has been fulfilled and I would like to ask when when were these things fulfilled and if you take the time to read these things you will I think you will find yourself asking those same questions and asking other questions like <clears throat> 
Why are so many of these things clearly end time eschatology, as in end time, end time? Since I did mention there could be a lot of end times, a lot of certain things can end. But what I'm talking about are, from all available evidence, these seem to be utterly end time, end time kinds of things. And so, what puzzles me is, for instance, the presence of Asher in so many end time prophecies. Clearly, end, end time. Even if you want to say, well, that was end times like around the time of Yosho. That's still far past when Asher should have been around, right? So we're told. So we're told. If these are truly end time things, you see, Armstrong and British Israelism knew this. And that's why they had to turn Germany into Asher. And other people have turned other things into Asher. Some have speculated Asher is Russia. Now, a big group of people who do that, I'm not saying everyone, but that would be a um, the whole Messianic Judaism sect like to do that because that idea works well into their type of end time eschatology which Palestine being the location of the promised land and the so-called Jews being the full representation of Yisrael. You see it works for them pretty good if they actually do tag Russia as Asher but I don't think Russia is Asher. And if I had to wager a guess, the one people I can see Russia as is Thershish. Usually translated as Tarshish, but Thershish. Therosh ish. Ish. Man. Rosh. Head. Th and E can both be used to denote oftentimes, and I know this isn't part of the way that you would be taught Masoretic Hebrew. This is by pattern I've observed that the TH oftentimes is used in the same way as our English the is used. The E can oftentimes be used to do the same thing. Now I do find it interesting that if you put the the and E together in Obri, you do get our English the, thus denoting a proper noun, the rush man, Thurashish. That's who I think Russia is in the Bible. And you can see Thurashish clearly in Ezekiel 38 and 39, amongst other places. Uh, traditionally, as far as the Bible is concerned, and what they have to tell us about Tharashish, they were, for who knows how long, they were pretty much the kings of the seas, and trade and sailing to vast, far places the world over. That's one thing Tharashish was known for. So, I think that well covers the, the second quote that we're looking at of New Testament quotes from the Old Testament context. And what I would say about that is that I can see, at least to a degree, the, the necessity of that quote, of course, because Herod wanted to know where the king of the Yehudi would be born and they gave him the passage. Um, doesn't sound bad to me, of course. Oh, one thing, and I've been pausing this to check these things, but I'm going to do it on the fly, because it's actually just a quick thing I wanted to, to look at, 
and I meant to do that while I was already there, and I did not. I'm going back to Micah 5 real fast. Micah 5, 2. And, uh-huh. Huh. Okay. Mushal. Interesting. What was that? 49.10? Let's see. Without the ooh, they have it as mshal. <clears throat> yes, it does sound a lot like mashia. Genesis 1.18. And this is the sun and the moon to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. Sun, moon, and stars. First usage of that, to rule over day and night. And then Genesis 3.16, to Hua, or Eve, he shall rule over thee. You shall rule over him. Ruler. Ruler, governor. Okay. So the next one is actually Matthew 2.15. Now this one is interesting because this gets into like a little bit of a subcategory of things that I've been noticing. Hit 2. Oh, I'm in the wrong translation. Hmm. So... I'll go back to the chart, and it says, uh, Matthew 2.15, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So we can compare this to a few passages. First off, it's very interesting, <clears throat> the Greek rendering. Aiguptos, saying, out of Egypt... I guptos. No. Let's see what the qu quick strong says. First off, pronunciation. Ahi guptos. One thing that intrigues me is the, in my opinion, very poor transliteration from Obri to Greek, then Greek to English where we end up with things like Gehenna and the such. And it says here in the Quick Strongs of uncertain derivation, and then it gives us what they would believe, that it would be Egyptus, the land of the Nile, Egypt. <clears throat> you can look into uh, the history of even that name, Egypt, where it comes from, where it's said to have come from, from some sailors stumbling onto a place that they were unaware of, and a native gave them a name of the local city, and they named the whole place that. That's the legend of Egypt, and I don't know if I believe it, like so much else. Now, there's um, a couple of different passages, you know, that we could look at, right? Because uh, in the text here in Matthew that the author, he doesn't give us a book, text. That happens. It happens a lot with Paul. You look at Paul, you know, and he'll say, it is written somewhere. <laughs> um, you know, so they didn't have a book, chapter, verse then, I guess. I don't know. I wasn't there. <clears throat> one is Exodus 4.22, and in Exodus 4.22, this is Yahweh speaking to Mashe, and he says, Ue Amrath, um, al paroa ke amar Yahweh bani bakri Yisrael. He's saying that you will speak towards Pharaoh, and he will say, you'll say like this, that Yahweh 
says, Bani, my son, Bakuri, chief, firstborn, Yishrael. He is speaking of the nation Yishrael. And then furthermore, in ad hoc Hebrew KJV English, and I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy Bakarek, like Bert Bakarek. Not quite. So there's two other references that um, you get with TSK. TSK is really helpful for things like that. Not always, but can be. They give another reference, which is number 24.8, and the KJV reads, God brought him forth out of Matsrim, and he had, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. <laughs> unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones, and pierce them through with his arrows. But that doesn't seem to be very much like the passage. Then we have Yesho, or Hosea, 11, 1. And it reads in the KJV, When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and called my son out of Mitzrim. Let's go look at that real fast, okay? So this one's pretty important. We're in Yesho, or Hosea, and we're going to start in 10. We got to back up to get context, right? So I'll back up all the way to 10.9 and just read from there and plow right through to that verse, which is the closest accurate word for word sort of quote that we've got, basically. 10.9 O ye shrall, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood, the battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. It's my desire that I should chastise them, and the people shall be gathered against them, when they shall bind themselves in their two furrows. Yeah, I understood that. And Aparim is as an heifer, that is, taught and love, loveth to tread out the corn. There's so many things in brackets here. But I passed over upon her fair neck, I will make Aparim to ride, Yehuda shall plow, and Yokab shall break his clods. So to yourselves in righteousness reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek Yahweh, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Now I understood that verse very well so. Agreed. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, you have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way, in the multitude of thy mighty men. Giborik. Therefore shall a tumult arise among thy people, and all thy fortresses shall be spoiled, as Shalman spoiled Beth Arbal. In the day of battle, the mother was dashed in pieces upon her children. So shall Beth Al do unto you, because of your great wickedness. In a morning shall the king of Yisrael utterly be cut off. When Yisrael was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Mitzrim. As they called them so, they went from them, they sacrificed unto Balim, and burned incense to graven images. I taught Aparim also to go, taking them by their arms, but they knew not that I healed them. I drew them with cords of a man with bands of love, and I was to them as they that take off the yoke in their jaws, and I laid meat unto them. He shall not return into the land of Mitzrim, but, uh -huh, but the Ashur shall be his king 
because they refused to return. To return where? To him. And then you go pretty far forward. You have um, the prophet Jeremiah and a large contingent actually going to Mutzraim. And, uh, that's another story. So based on what I saw in Matthew, because what we're, what we're seeing in Matthew is um, Herod. Um, right? Herod had learned from these Mag Magoi, Magi, that uh, there was to be a king born. And he learned from the scribes that he was to be born in Bethlehem, Aprathay. So this area, which I would say uh, Bethlehem, Aprathay, would be a suburb. And Aprathay was specifically mentioned. And we know that it was in that area, so a suburb of Bethlehem. Um, so to back up a little bit, Matthew, uh, it says um, this is for, the, I guess, the Magoi or the Magi, they being warned in, of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They departed their own country. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, said, Arise, take the young child and his mother and flee into yeah. Aegyptus. <laughs> and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Aegyptus. All right, so Matthew 2.15, and then there was... Uh, and was there until the death of Herod they stayed in this place, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Out of Aegyptus have I called my son. So the closest we found of that was Hosea 11.1. 1. And in the context of Hosea 11.1, 1, that's not very flattering context, I also don't see anything eschatological or messianic in either Hosea 11.1, 1, nor Exodus 4.22, nor Numbers 4.28. As much as it makes me uncomfortable to say these things, and it probably makes many uncomfortable to hear them, I don't see the correlation. It looks to me like isolating text. Unless, because remember I said yesterday, there could be a number of reasons that these things are so. But I have to point them out, because if I don't, I'm not being honest. If I, if I hide these things and, and kick them under the rug while nobody's looking, then I am just as bad as when guys like Fomenko or Morozov diddle with biblical text too. So I can't criticize them if they do that and then see things that I find to be a problem and ignore them because if I ignore them and if I can smooth them over then maybe in some way that could strengthen my faith or my argument or I wouldn't want to hurt other people's faith. But if it is only faith you have and it's not based on substance, I know the old line from the book of Hebrews that faith is the substance of things hoped for, right? It's the evidence of things not seen. Well, Okay, let's go to uh, Abraham, Noah. Any men said to be righteous because they believed Yahweh. They did believe him, but he first came to them and spoke to them, and they believed him. That part is important. So now, Matthew 2.18. 
In the KJV, in Rama, was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning? Rahal, reaping for her, weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they were not. Interesting. The Septuagint puts it Jeremiah 38.15. The Masoretic puts it Jeremiah 31.15. So, for the sake of expedience, we won't go into that huge difference there, seven chapter difference between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint, because although that is of import, what we want to do is we want to check the context of the passage that we just read. In the context of the passage that we had just read was that Joseph is warned to take his wife and the child down to Aiguptos <clears throat> and hide there till he receives further instruction. And then it says that uh, Herod went about murdering all of these children in this area um, that were, it usually says two years and under, and some have said that two years was what we would call one year, that they started out a year at the time you were born and numbered that way. I don't know, but that's not important to our context right now. We just want to check our context. Now, the texts are a bit different between the uh, Septuagint and the Masoretic, that's for sure. But we're really only going to have to read a couple of verses uh, to get the context and to see if that is making sense in the context that it's put in up there in Matthew. Because the, the sort of thought changes, and I'll tell you this, okay, so when we're in the Septuagint, we need to be in 38.15 as the uh, quoted verse. Um, I'll mark it real quick. <clears throat> and actually, I don't have to do this. I'm sorry. I lost my Jeremiah. I lost my Jeremiah. 3815. Okay. I'm just going to go back here. Um, okay. I wanted to see if I had to actually look. And I'm going to. I'm going to hit Matthew 218 real quick. Just helps. Because we want to see the context and then compare it. Now I just told you basically the, the story context. Um, but, however, starting in Matthew 2.16 it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof. So, like I told you, um, Ephrathe would have been a suburb of Beth. Laham. Okay, so from two years and under, according to the time which he had diligently acquired from the wise men. Uh, Matthew 2 7, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy. That which was spoken, Jeremy the prophet. So that's different. And then he does uh, quote it. So remember, The murder of Herod on all of these children. The writer of Matthew was saying, so that would fulfill what was spoken by Jeremy, the prophet. And then he quotes this, in Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rahal weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Since I'm already in KJV, I'll go back to Jeremy. Jeremy spoken 3115. 
And as I said, you really don't need... Okay, the context before... Again, this is actually eschatological because a lot of the so-called Old Testament is eschatological. A lot of it. More than many people who don't read the Bible much would think. Um, and so all of uh, chapter 31 up to 3115 is very much eschatological promises towards Yisrael towards Aparim in general, okay? And Aparim is usually uh, translated Ephraim, which was the youngest son, but, but given the elder son blessing of Joseph. Joseph and his two sons specifically, Ephraim in particular, had the birthright blessing. But Ephraim, along with many of the other tribes, were cast away, vomited uh, from the land, and put out of the sight of Yahweh, long before the prophet Jeremy lived. So much of this is eschatological, making promises to call Aprim or Ephraim back. Yusap the sons of Yusap, which would be represented not only... See, when you say Aprim, you are representing very much most of the tribes that are not Judah, and maybe Binyamin, or, and a lot of Louis, because only some of Louis still remained in Judah. A lot of them were taken away. <sighs> There's so much we don't know and understand about these things, historically and eschatologically. But that's what's going on. Don't take my word for it. Go read it yourself. But starting in Jeremiah 31, 15, Thus saith Yahweh, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rahel weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children, because they were not. Thus saith Yahweh, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith Yahweh. And they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith Yahweh, that thy children shall come again to their own border. Huh? That doesn't sound contextually like what I just read in Matthew. Here, it sounds like Rahel, who is a representation of the mother of the children of Yisrael, because Rahel was the mother of Yusap, or Joseph. Joseph was the father of Aprim and Minshe, or Ephraim and Manasseh. So this is appropriate. What's also strange to me is that the quote in Matthew, Bethlehem, Ephrathay, huh, that's where he went, <clears throat> Bethlehem, and all the suburbs to murder these children, but... Uh, from everything I understand from the Bible, anyways, there would have been next to no children of Ephraim, Manasseh, Joseph there, Benjamin. Rahel was also his mother. But it's said to be in Judah. Okay, we can chalk these up as just, um, you know, symbolic. However, I still don't see a correlation between Rahal weeping for her children who are gone and Yahweh comforting Rahal that they will come back from the land of the enemy. They shall come again to their own border. Where in Matthew, those mothers would be weeping because they're Babies were murdered. I'm sure the 
I'm sure Brenton Septuagint says something different. Help shed some clarity from Jeremy. Well, I don't understand. So in Greek, Matthew, he's called Jeremy. But in Brenton's Greek translation, he's Jeremiah. They need to get their story straight. It's the same thing. <clears throat> A lot of eschatological um, talk. All before this. Same kind of material, okay? And there is sort of a shift in thought from verse 14 to verse 15, and that's why we can start in 15. So, Jeremy, 38, 15, from Brenton's, A voice was heard in Ramah of lamentation and weeping and wailing. Rahal would not cease weeping for her children because they are not. Thus saith Yahweh. Let the, I hate just hearing that, the Lord. Because I know it's that's not it. It's mostly Yahweh. Once in a while, it is Adon or Adoni, but usually that will be with Yahweh. Sometimes Aliyam, but Yahweh. It's used almost 7,000 times in the Old Testament, so-called. So, listen. Thus saith Yahweh, let thy voice cease from weeping and thine eyes from thy tears, for there is a reward for thy works, and they shall return from the land of thine enemies. There shall be an abiding home for thy children. I have heard the sound of Aparim lamenting and saying, Thou hast chastened me, and I was chastened. I, as a calf, not or was not willingly taught, turn thou me, and I shall turn, for thou art Yahweh, my Alain. Again, it just doesn't share the same context. So unless somebody's got another verse that they can find in Jeremy, um, that is the same about Rachel weeping. We can do TSK cross-reference to see if anything else is produced, and it's actually erroneously uh, leading us to Jeremy 31.15. Um, mm, says 30.24... No. 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 Nope. A lot of eschatological passages there. Uh, no. No. And it, it's pretty much word for word. So, it would be hard to say that that wasn't it. It is pretty much word for word. So in the in the Masoretic, uh, again it's thirty one fifteen. Okay, I'll bite. Yep. And the physical text is saying the same thing. It's reflecting accurately enough what the English text I had been reading was saying to say that that is, again, the context. Rachel's... Rahel, as she's weeping, she won't be comforted for her sons, her children, are gone. And Yahweh gives her an oracle two times, telling her the first time, that they shall return from the land of their enemies. The second time, that they shall once again come within their borders. Do those quotes accurately fit in context with the story we're reading in Matthew? 
I know a lot of people, they get kind of nervous about this, especially people who have a great faith in the Bible's accuracy that it could not have been tampered with or whatever it is and I can understand that of all people I can understand that uh, I didn't just start this journey of mine a couple years ago when I started making videos this has been ongoing for a very very long time and there are very deep running root causes for this psychologically physically so I understand but unless anybody can come up with sound reason for why some of these passages that I've cited so far are not in harmony with the context of where they're supposedly quoted from I have to point this out and there can always be a number of reasons why something is what it is of course I'm just telling you here it is I have tried to provide as I went what possibilities there could be because the obvious either atheistic or any anyone who is at enmity with Christianity the New Testament or New Testament and Old Testament Bible altogether their answer would be that it's all poppycock it's all nonsense it's not true spurious lies that's their answer but it doesn't have to be that simple black and white the atheist and the enemy of the Bible's answer and the answer from I don't know what are we gonna say the Christian who just says well no matter what I've got faith and I don't have to understand because that's not as far as I'm concerned it's not good enough I don't <clears throat> how are you going to win a debate with ammunition like this against you and this isn't all about winning debates I'm not in this to win debates but the reason that if somebody had the ammunition of just the passages I've read so far and just the problems with contextualizing that we've seen thus far the reason they would win in a debate like that which winning is only a little smidgen of all there is to life and understanding you see so that's not the end-all be-all but the reason they would is because obviously the passages in the New Testament and the context that we're seeing them in aren't lining up with the context that we see in the Old Testament in fact it really looks a lot like eisegesis isolating those texts or applying a different meaning to them than they had in the first place am I saying that's the final answer nope I am saying that is what it is I'm showing you what I see and I gotta go because the kids are up in a few days a week we have a few extra kids so it's already getting loud and my wife is doing everything she can to try to keep it not so loud until I finish God bless her so uh, thank you all for your prayers and uh, especially inquiries concerning uh, my cancer and what's going on with that uh, I appreciate it as always uh, I've always said I just thank you all very much for your prayers anything beyond that is a super extra special thing so uh, thanks again and we'll see you soon <laughs>